What if you were on an airplane and this airplane crashed in the Pacific Ocean? Would you eat an insect or a snail? When you get these uh, people that are debaters, you could tell them 18 things about the beauties of veganism and they'll just try to shoot down every little thing. They use their mind as a weapon. I don't really like to get into debaters too much, but one little Jedi mind trick I found is useful. Then I'll just be like, okay, well, can you tell me something that's good about veganism? And like, they don't even know what to do. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with all of you world changers. So I'm so honored to speak to you, truly. Uh, it brings me so much joy to be with all, all these beautiful people, this positive energy. So my journey's been kind of interesting. I never thought I'd be an animal rights activist. Uh, I, started hand, I started rescuing street dogs, and then I started handing out leaflets, and I was very shy, very awkward. And that led to me going to 700 cities, handing out uh, um, you know, leaflets at universities, then I did you know, media tours, ballot initiatives, a little public speaking, and then uh, now working for Vegan Outreach. And so, you know, I've had the opportunity to speak to hundreds of thousands of people about going vegan. So, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I hope through this talk, hopefully there'll be some food for thought about if there's, you know, something you find that maybe I should try this out or maybe something you shouldn't do. So through my, my own mistakes, I've learned that there's some things I, I did that were not as effective and other things you can do that is very effective. And I wanted to share that with you and I hope you, uh, you know, find some of it valuable. First, why is the vegan revolution a social revolution? Like most of you, I probably, I don't know about you, I never heard about this in church, in my school. I never saw this on, the, on television during the football game. The only reason I was learned about uh, veganism and animal rights was because somebody gave me information at a university. Somebody sat me down with them to watch um, a documentary. Someone asked if I wanted to volunteer and they kind of held my hand and introduced me to activism. So it's a social revolution. We have to get other people involved. We have to share this message. Who do the animals have? You know, there's so much the animals don't have. They don't have the freedom to play. They don't have the freedom to turn around. They don't even have the freedom to be intact. And they certainly don't have the freedom to a peaceful end. They have innocence, but not justice. But I like to think, and I believe that the most important thing they do have, they have all of you, they have all of us that are free, and we can use our freedom and solidarity to speak up to them. So why not do more of that? Because that's the only way the vegan revolution is gonna to come to full fruition. So I think doing outreach, there's a few preliminary things to be mindful of. You know, when your friends or family aren't vegan, your coworkers aren't vegan, or you know, people are just rude sometimes, and you go to the supermarket and there's just all this death, you know, you know next to you, you're just like, what is going on on this planet? It's very easy to be, you know, like, what is going on? Never forget, in your own life and in the, the world at large, nothing is static. I don't know about you, but when I was 10 years old, I wanted to buy more Legos, I wanted to be an athlete, you know, I wanted to have lots of money, or whatever the case may be. Then, you know, you're 20 or you're 30, you know, if you have a child or your parents get sick or, you know, you have other things to concerns, like what's important in your life changes. You know, not killing an innocent being is more important than me having a hot dog. You know, like you have a greater consciousness as you develop. So all of us are on our own journey. So same with the people we speak to. Likewise, society itself is on a journey. You know, you look at the United States, one of the worst forms of slavery in history. Now everybody's like, this is horribly wrong. How many people were against it 160 years ago? Not enough. You know, you could beat your wife if the stick wasn't bigger than this. Women couldn't go to school, couldn't have a job. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, we don't have full equality yet, but you see that things are progressing. You can't have little kids working in factories anymore. People had to fight to get the eight-hour workday. Um, you know, India had to fight to be liberated from the colonialism and many other places. So you, even though things may, sing, things may seem bleak or people may be entrenched in stone, realize that things are always in motion. People are always changing. You know, it's, it seems like we're static here on this, or, you know, where I'm standing right now. It's not true. We're going around the sun, the earth is spinning, the galaxy is twirling, and we're expanding into universe. Uh, we're expanding into nothing that has to be something. There's millions of things going on, on our body. I don't want to belabor the point, but everything's in motion. So don't be so disappointed if you talk to somebody and they're not there yet. For some people, maybe it takes a heart attack, maybe it makes seeing a video, but every time we talk to someone, we can get them um, along the way. So realize that nothing is static. Why do outreach also? Whether it's, you know, this is mostly on one-on-one, -on -one, but whether it's leafleting, showing VR, cubes, showing videos, sharing stuff on your Facebook, why do outreach? If you're a vegan and, and you're a seventh level the vegan and you read every little ingredient for, you know, 35 minutes when you're at the supermarket, I love you. 
But in just a few short hours of your time doing activism, you can change several dozen people's lives forever. And every single person we get to go vegan or in that direction, that's gonna save you know, hundreds if not thousands of animals. And then every person that goes vegan, so once they have this consciousness, it's such a beautiful thing, you wanna share it, hopefully they will affect their, you know, their father, their mother, their mistress. You never know how far one new vegan's energy can go. That's another reason why it's a social revolution. Uh, I've done a ton of activism. I've been fortunate enough to, to, you know, rescue dogs. I thought I would be a guy with 50 dogs, and I think I would have been perfectly happy. You know, would have had to pick up a lot of poop. But one of the reasons I became an uh, advocate for veganism is that, unfortunately, 99% animals that suffer are for food. So I thought that I could save the most amount of animals by trying to help people go vegan. And I still go to demos for other things, but I, I wanted to do as much good as I humanly could. And along that vein, too, for every activist you birth, I mean, how many animals does that save? So we have to get more people involved. I did want to mention again that, yes, I have spoken to tons of people, but I, I don't want to pretend I have all the answers. So this is more just of a rumination than a declaration. There are some things, you know, talking to so many people in Wyoming, Michigan, Mexico, India, Scotland, you know, you pick up little things over the course of time. So I want to share with you some mistakes that I used to make. Uh, when I first saw earthlings, I was so overwhelmed by the animal horrors out there that I wanted everybody to go vegan yesterday, and I had the passion. Or just, I didn't, you know, I just felt compelled. It's not even that I wanted to do it. It's just it had to be done. But I don't think I was uh, as effective as I could have been, you know, because I think I overwhelmed people with, with information. You know, I had all this information I had learned. I was researching. I wanted everybody to know it. So when you talk to your friends, coworkers, or on the streets, try not to overwhelm people. If you emotionally overwhelm people or information overwhelm people, they're likely to dismiss you and the information, no matter how good it is. You know, you can't be like, do you know what they're doing to pigs? They're ripping their testicles off. You know, you don't even know the coral reefs are dying. All the, you know, the cows, the babies are stolen. You have no idea. You eat the egg, your prostate's gonna fall out. Like, you know, it's just, you know, there's chemtrails. You know, there's too much information. People are gonna dismiss you and the task at hand. So I think it's very powerful to leave, you know, two or three items with a person that, that, that's gonna stick rather than giving them 12 items, even if those 12 items are really amazing. And that's good if you have a quick interaction with someone, but it's also great if you have repeat exposure to someone. You know, I would love to see everybody be vegan yesterday, but slow, uh, change is a slow process. People that change slowly tend to stay vegan. As much as I love, you know, I met somebody today who was telling me at lunch that she saw a documentary and she was vegan ever since. I mean, I think that's beautiful and, and inspiring. But for a lot of people, it's gonna take a little time. So, you know, it's fine to be patient. So don't overwhelm people. And don't think that you can outthink and outrational people. Rationalizations have their point in our persuasion, but I think the number one thing people need to know is have an emotional connection to the suffering of innocent animals. You know, we know that fast food is wrong for us. We know that smoking is horrible. There's nobody here smoking at this whole conference that's not going to regret it one day. And it breaks my heart to see these beautiful activists, uh, you know, smoke cigarettes. I, I recently had young friends die of a. Uh, you know, cancer from smoking. So uh, rational decisions does not dictate our behavior. So as that relates to veganism, excuse me, you know, let people know about the individual animal and how much they suffer, and then you can rationalize, give it rationalizing reasons. But myself and other people, I see sometimes they get into this debate, and that's kind of a bad dynamic because people aren't listening, and you're just trying to like use your intellect to tear people down. That, that's usually not connecting at its best level. So try not to uh, get into these debates. Although I'm not going to deny it. You know, every now and then you get people talking and they ask que questions or make comments that are so dumb. You know, you can't help but think. You know, really, you're the sperm that won. But. Uh, you know, I try to not be negative with people. Um, when it comes to changing all of society, you know, not everybody's going to go vegan. It's a numbers game. You know, I happen to leaflet. There's all this different research on the efficacy of leafleting. But, you know, my goal is always to get 20 to 30 people go vegan that day, which I think is incredible. You know, what if I told you, hey, by tomorrow at 3 p.m., I want you to get 25 people to go vegan for the next 50 years. How would you do that? If we hand out 2,000 leaflets, statistically, statistically, we most likely will do that or get people on the way. Uh, however, you know, that would be 1,970 people that maybe you handed a leaflet to that didn't go vegan. But really focused on the people that we are changing. And I'm not going to waste my time with people that are super not receptive. Like, I'm not going to talk for 25 years to my cousin who's not going to go vegan when I could talk to college students that are receptive to the message. 
you, you know, there's some social change studies that, you know, you need 15% people to go vegan, you need early adopters, you need people to be reducers, and then once it becomes socially un unacceptable, you know, society will change. So I think it's very important to uh, speak to people being mindful of that, that, that we can't, we're trying to get as many people as possible on board, but don't waste your time with people that are super unreceptive. You can still be super polite and informative, but then kind of move on. And I, this happens a lot of times with families, because we love our families so much, and it breaks our hearts that, you know, our, our, you know, our father may not be vegan receptive. You know, we can still give him information, but, you know, are we going to talk to him for nine hours, or, or you hit the streets and get people that will definitely be receptive? I think it's a better use of time to, uh, you know, hit the streets. So some things to do when you talk to people one about leafleting is show people you care about them. I don't care what it is. If you show people you care about them, the walls come down. Uh, there's so many times I've talked to people and they've been rude to me, and I just say like, oh, what's your name? Let me shake your hand. They're like, oh, do you have any kids? Or, you know, what do you study here? You know, just like I have some interest in your life. Or like, oh, you have asthma? Oh, did you know that, you know, some people, a lot of people, they stop having dairy and their asthma improves dramatically. Uh, or, you know, a lot of times people have not been receptive in conversation. I start talking about the health benefits. And people really come around to be like, oh, this is a human issue too. This is something that affects me as well. It's not just an animal issue. So, uh, you know, let people know you care about them. And it's perfectly fine to talk about animal ethics and animal suffering and then just step over here, you know, engage in a little personal banter. Walls come down. Step back here. You know, if anything, most likely people are more receptive. And at a minimum, they see you as a friendly, kind, um, you know, vegan and passionate active. It's not as someone that's just like dumping information on them. Uh, I think when I started doing activism, I started making a lot of statements. And I think is uh, over the course of these eight years or what have you, the older I get, the more experienced I get, I start to do more questions. Like, did you know what they do to pigs? You know, do you know what happens to human arteries versus the arteries of a lion when they eat meat? You know, um, did you ever consider you know, I ate dairy most of my life. Did you ever realize the suffering that's in dairy? A lot of people never have. So asking questions is a great way to start a conversation. And you're kind of helping be like a midwife and helping people make connections themselves. Rather than saying like, uh, you know, killing animals is horrible. Be like, you know, do you think there's a difference between this dog and this pig? You know, do they both have eyes, hearts, legs? Do they both get scared when there's thunder? I mean, or it me, what is the difference between this cow and this dog? You know, get people to think. That's one of the most powerful ways for people to make connections. Along that vein, too, of all the people I've spoken to, the, if I only have people for like two minutes or even five minutes, short conversation, the number one thing I tell people is, is what I like to call the dog and pig analogy. And I found it to be very powerful. The thinking behind it is you're trying to take people's love of, or, or familiarity or caring about dogs and transfer it onto all animals and especially farm animals. So a lot of times I'll tell people, like, it was if I was in Square and Ash and I had this little pit bull puppy. And what if I held, the, held them real tight in a headband and I started to pull his teeth out with pliers one by one? Do you think that would hurt? What if I ripped his testicles off with no anesthesia? You know, would that hurt less from a pig than a human being? I mean, I don't know, but I'm sure it would hurt a lot. And what if I took his tail off in front of all these people and then I put this cute little puppy that was playing one minute and now he's screaming bloody murder and he's in so much pain. What if I took this brutalized little guy and put him in a box where he can't even turn around? What do you think people would do here as I'm walking down the main shopping area of Esh, Stockholm, Vienna, wherever? Do you think they would try to stop me? Yes. Do you think somebody would call the police? Yes. Do you think if I was arrested, I would go to prison for felony animal cruelty? Yes. Well, then the question logically becomes, and I smile a little bit maybe, you know, if it's wrong to torture this one dog in front of all these people, why is it right to torture these, you know, tens of thousands of pigs behind closed doors? So asking those questions, get that person to think, and gets that person to have to come up and think about those things within their own brain. And that's getting them to think, uh, you know, ad nauseum again with the Socratic questions is much more powerful than just saying, like, it's just as bad to kill a pig as it is a dog. You know, when you walk them through that whole area, they start to make connections themselves. Uh, one of the most powerful things also I want to share with you is when you talk to people that are resistant to the message or people that are defensive, they're like, oh, Vic, he's the vegan guy from Vegan Outreach, you know, this guy, like he's like the mega vegan, he's going to judge me, uh, he's going to attack me, he's going to make me feel like a horrible person. I learned something when I was in Michigan, I think about six years ago. I was actually giving a talk, and, and at that time they told me I couldn't say the word vegan, which looking back at it seems ridiculous, but I, I went with it at the time, unfortunately. And it was a very conservative audience. There was hunters in the audience, you know, uh, camouflage. 
And when I started to talk, I decided I'm just going to talk about my own journey. I'm not going to say anything about veganism. So I told them, hey, I had a dog growing up. I loved my dog. I ate meat most of my life. Never thought two things about it. Um, you know, I, so they kind of mirror them. They see themselves in me, that we both ate meat. We have that in common. And then when I talk about my own journey and then how I learned a little bit watching Earthlings, seeing a documentary, how I thought that, like, oh, when I went vegan, I thought, like, what the heck am I going to eat? There's nothing to eat. Then, like, oh, it was a never-expanding expansion. It was an exploration of food. Yeah, I learned how beautiful it was, that I didn't have to care just about a dog and dolphins, but I could care about all life. And, you know, I never thought the food could be so tasty. Uh, as you talk about your own life with people, especially people in your closer inner circle, they won't feel defensive because your own story is never wrong, and you're not talking about them. So talking about your own experiences is extremely powerful with people who may be resistant or afraid of, you know, afraid of the message. Uh, one little mistake I've seen people make sometimes is that I, I've met people who like they went vegan for health, and you know, for the next thousand people they meet, they're going to talk about health to every single person. I think one of the key points in communication is realizing like everybody's different, everybody has different needs, so listen to other people, see what interests them. Uh, don't just be myopic or one-dimensional, only talk about one issue all the time, or, you know, uh, how horrible horse carriages is. Yes, it's horrible, but, you know, we really want to mention when we have people the ethics of animal rights and how, uh, you know, the animals have done nothing wrong. Vegan food is delicious. Uh, it's a form of ethics, not just a diet. You know, we want to mention these key points and get people to, uh, excuse me, and get people to see that it is an ethical issue. And with not being one dimensional, I think it's very important to start and end like a sandwich. The bread would be ethical animal rights. Studies unfortunately show that most people that go vegan end up, or you know, go vegan end up going back to eating animals. So I think it's very important that the people, it's just research has shown that people that go vegan for the animals are the people that stay vegan, not just for health or because their, you know, their boyfriend did it or what have you. So I really want to inculcate the ethics of it, that eating animals is completely unnecessary, wrong, harmful for you, harmful for them, harmful for the environment. You know, talk about health, you know, talk about dead zones, you know, talk about whatever they want to talk about, you know, ask them how their day is, what, what do they study, and then at the end of it, come back to you. But yeah, you know, the real reason I went vegan is not because I uh, hate the taste of beef or anything. You know, I ate it for most of my life. The reason is that, you know, for me, it's unethical to harm an innocent being. You know, I did nothing right to be born as a white man in Sweden in a time of peace with all you know, decent health, just like these innocent pigs did absolutely nothing wrong to, to be mutilated, confined, tortured, and then killed as a six-month-year-old. So uh, animal ethics start and end with. I find uh, people stick better. I think it's great to be excited about small changes. I think we all want everybody, the whole world, to be vegan yesterday, but everything's a continuum. If your mother made a vegan meal and she eats meat seven times a day, you know, give her a big hug. Mom, I love you. This is so great. You're doing something that's healthy for you. When everybody takes any step towards veganism, like, oh, Vic, you know, this is the first vegan meal I ordered at a restaurant, but I want you to know I'm with you. I got you. You know, I don't want them to do it for me. I want them to do it for the animals. But, like, still, you know, a positive stroke, like, that's so great that you're trying this out. You know, you'll see that there's delicious food out there. So. Even if people don't go fully vegan right away, give them positive strokes and affirmations um, if they take any steps towards veganism or exploring other foods. When you talk about animal rights too, uh, Stalin has a famous quote, great guy. He says that a million deaths is a statistic, one death is a tragedy. And I think there's a lot of truth in that because you know it's hard to think about like, oh, you know, 19 billion animals or, you know, 19,000 animals are killed in animal testing this minute. It's depressing, but it's hard to identify with the suffering of any one individual. So uh, especially when I talk to students about dairy, I like to mention um, some of these rescued dairy cows, like in Edgar's mission in, uh, I believe, Australia, where she had been forced to be impregnated. The baby was taken away from her over and over. Then they had a big space, and they would be like, why is she walking to the end of the sanctuary back and forth all the time? And what did they see at the end of the sanctuary that they, she'd hidden from the humans? She had had a baby and didn't want anyone to know because her uh, baby was taken so many times. So just that one little anecdote demonstrates that clearly this female cow has feelings, cares about it for young, is intelligent. So uh, talking about the individuals is very great. Giving them names, you know, just like, oh, 10,000 pigs, 
they're not doing so good versus like Sheila the pig, she got out of her crate and then she like used her snout to open up all these other crates. So we really want to humanize the, the, the individual animal. And this is also very important versus the, you know, giving rationalizations like, oh, meat is not good for you, you know, you know, make them feel for the suffering of the one innocent being. My language is very poor. I make these t-shirts when I was younger and it says like it on the back of it and I'm always a little ashamed <laughs> because uh, language is so important because when there's a word, there's an idea and then it's in reality. One of the cool things v uh, Vegan Outreach does is we talked about veganism before anybody ever heard the word. In 2008, I can't tell you how many times people are like, what's a vegan? But once people know what it, you know, all the time, Arkansas, Wyoming, Oklahoma, and they thought I was a weirdo. I'll get to that later. Some people still do. The uh, uh, animal is not it. It is a he or a she. It's an individual. So be very mindful when you refer to farm animals that individual, not to dehumanize them by making them, you know, an anonymous, inanimate object. When you get these uh, people that are debaters, and they're gonna just tell you everything you did is wrong. You could tell them 18 things about the beauties of veganism and they'll just try to shoot down every little thing. They use their mind as a weapon. I don't really like to get into debaters too much, but one little Jedi mind trick I found is useful. Then I'll just be like, okay, well, can you tell me something that's good about veganism? And like, they don't even know what to do. They're like, they're so just like a pit bull ready to, well, bad example, but you know, they're, they're, uh, they're just trying to tear down what you have to say. So sometimes just asking them, it's Socratic, and it gets their mind shifted to be like, well, what is good about veganism? You have all these things that are bad about it. Well, I guess, you know, you know, people will, they'll have something to say, and it's really powerful. They come around sometimes. As much as I don't want to, uh, you know, react to the debaters, sometimes I get people that ask me fantastic questions. Victor, tell me this. Got some good information there, but what if you were on an airplane? And this airplane you know, crashed in the Pacific Ocean. And you had to swim for three days, and you made it to an island. And it was your grandmother's birthday in three months, and you had said that you would do anything to be at her birthday. Would you eat an insect or a snail? You know, so, you know, so they, they feel like, oh, I got you, buddy. You know, but uh, the real question becomes, all right, that's very clever, but what if you lived in Esch? What if you lived in Stuttgart, Stockholm, Vienna, Warsaw, and there was a zillion vegan options. What if you could get the Beyond Burger, which is coming this summer? I'm pretty pumped. Uh, what if you could go to the supermarket and buy so many delicious things, so many amazing foods? Would you still choose to hurt an innocent being? So people ask you stupid things. Just, uh, you know, don't be phased by it. Don't give back to the energy. Just steer it back to the question and ask them, like, you know, you know what if you lived in Nash and you could eat, eat all these delicious things? Uh, I probably would uh, eat a bug to see my grandma, but I'll give you that. Doing outreach, you have to be positive. You know, I feel kind of, I don't know why I'm wired this way. I'm kind of generally lazy most of my life, but you know, I don't care if I slept two or three hours. When outreach time comes, I, you know, I go and leaflet, you know, I do more administration stuff now. But I learned to never give up on other people and never give up on yourself. You know, when I was younger, I had very low self-esteem, social anxiety, you know, I would tremble when I gave talks. Um, and I realized that if you speak with kindness and sincerity, never underestimate the power of your own voice. I can't tell you how many people have gone vegan that I've spoken to, how many people hit me up on social media, like, oh, you gave a talk to my class. I just want you to know, you know, my whole family's vegan now, you know, thank you. And I thought the guy wasn't even listening. Uh, true story. He, I saw him the second time and I was like, oh, it's the guy that's not listening. And he's like, Vic, you know, I even don't smoke those cigarettes because they're tested on animals. And my girlfriend and my family, I was astounded. But um, I, this has happened to me so many times. People find me on Facebook, like, oh, you were in Transylvania, and you know, just want you to know the leafleting works. And uh, which is funny to me, because I mean, not only was I so social awkward, I couldn't even get my dog, first dog to sit. And now, you know, I think I've helped gotten thousands of people to go vegan. So uh, from my experience and yours, never underestimate the power of your own voice. If you do outreach, you don't have to know everything. Sometimes people are afraid to volunteer. You know, if you, as long as you know three main things, what more do you need to know? The animals are innocent, being vegan is delicious. Uh, you know, let me, let, let me talk to you about any questions you have. I can always get back to you if I don't know the answers. You know, we don't have to be uh, all-knowing Minervas to uh, do outreach or to talk to our social circle. So I think it's important to, to, to have a degree of certitude. When I talk about veganism, like if I was trying to ask someone on a date, I'd be like, you know, 
you'd be lucky to hang out with me. Even if there was nothing physical, like we, I would have good conversation, I would be kind to you. You know, I have self-worth. This issue, veganism is important. You're, it could save your life. It could make you live longer. It could give you purpose that transcends your own ego. Like I believe veganism is essential for the for progress, and I feel like I'm doing a service to whoever I'm talking to because you know Harvard Harvard Medical School. You could heart could be 12 to 16 years longer incidence of heart disease, cancer. So when you speak to people about veganism, you're doing a service for the animals, but you're also doing a service for that person. And if you believe that the issue is important, and that they're likely once they have, if they have a harder brain, if you believe that once they have more information they're gonna to gravitate towards more vegans, it's more likely to manifest. And I'm not too you know, new age, but I really think it's very powerful to believe in yourself, believe in the power of your own voice. Uh, and that doesn't mean that I can control anything. I just know that I can speak with kindness and sincerity, and you know, I can't control what other people do, but I do believe that people are intelligent and caring, and once they make the connections, they will go vegan, and it's amazing how often that does happen. It's, surveys have revealed too that the number one reason people change uh, social change is because it's not socially acceptable. So I don't like to be manipulative, but every now and then, you know, if you're hanging out with your friends, it might be something like, oh, you know, I could never date, uh, you know, a woman that hurts animals three times a day. You know, I don't like to be rude or put people on the spot too much, but it's interesting how if you somehow project that it's, you know, it's so weird to eat animals. Uh, Nietzsche talks a lot about the transvaluation of values. You know, like, like, you know, being willing to sell your mother's teeth to make a dollar and be this hard driving businessman that hurts people. Like, oh, look how driven he is. But like, you know, kindness is strength too. And uh, it's really, you know, hurting animals. It's like 2018, like really dude, like, you know, get with the program. So I don't wanna be rude, but also I wanna make it like not socially acceptable to harm animals, or at least to have like some minor pushback to just people like people are not okay with this. Psychologically, we have to realize that most people, what do they see veganism as? If they're not familiar with the concept or they haven't met kind vegans, what do they see it as? You know, do they think about animal suffering on a daily basis? No. So when they hear the word vegan, they're gonna be like, oh, okay, these animals are being hurt. I don't wanna think about it. I don't wanna think about how I'm harming animals. Uh, you know, it brings up these negative emotions. They feel you know, guilty, judged, even if they ignore it on some level. People, a lot of people that don't, aren't vegan, they associate veganism with all this dark stuff. And yes, animals are suffering. But for, vegan, for me, veganism is not about animals being tortured. For me, veganism is about beauty. It's about delicious food. It's about an increase in love. And that's another thing I ask people, like, is it more loving to just care about dogs and dolphins? Or is it more loving to care about dogs, pigs, cows, chickens, dolphins, and everything in the universe? You know, there's no limit on who we can love. And veganism is just the next step in ethics. And it's a beautiful way to live. You ask most people what they regret about going vegan, they didn't do it earlier. You know, let people know this stuff. And uh, don't hide the beauty of veganism. This is almost, a, you know, not a full panacea, but veganism addresses so many social ills. It's going to keep you alive longer. You're going to spend more time with your children, you know, most likely. Um, you know, it's such a beautiful evolution of mankind and ethics that don't hide your vegan pride. When I went vegetarian, I don't know why, I was, like, ashamed of it. A few things on talking to people, too, is that don't be so sensitive. We're all sensitive in here. God knows I'm sensitive. I saw earthlings I couldn't, you know, see straight for four days, you know. Um, I'm extremely sensitive, but I don't think it's always a bad thing. But when you do activism, not really the best time to be sensitive. I'm trying to talk, give this information to as many people as I can in a kind way, but I can't control what they do. So if, if you, you know, I've been at, well, I was on a media tour once in Florida. We were all, we were the, it was the most watched and most commented on uh, section they had done on the TV station in their history for a weekend. We had people crying. We had a truck showing uh, factory farm footage, and uh, we were on three TV stations. People were crying. Like seven people told us on the spot we're going vegan. We met one jerk. First time volunteer, I heard her talk. We were driving back and on the phone to her friend. She kept talking for 25 minutes about how horrible this one jerk was. Didn't say one thing about the fact we were on television, the fact that so many people cried, hugged, thanked us, brought us food. There's so many people watching. So when you do activism, you know, focus on the positives, the people we're reaching. I'm not worried about the eight leaflets that ended up in the trash or, you know, you know the one guy that said, like, meat is delicious. I'm worried about the 20 people that uh, went vegan or vegetarian that day. I'm worried about the 200 people that read the information. Now their brains are softened for the next time they get the information. So. Uh, you know, don't be too worked up by just one or two jerks. And now, you know, leafing so much, it's like, if I meet two jerks, I filled my quota. If I didn't meet two jerks, like, whatever. It's like water off a duck's back. You know, it doesn't, uh, 
we don't have to react to, to rude people. And just because we care about this issue so much doesn't mean that we have to care about it uh, when we talk to, you know, on the streets, friends, coworkers, or whatnot, or, or not take it in uh, so deeply. You know, people are on their own pathway. They may apologize to you in the future. And, you know, some things we can't control. We can only control that we, you know, give maximum effort. I want to talk to you briefly about burnout. You know, I would get tired after 18-week tours and, you know, not sleeping enough and, you know, being on the pavement. And, you know, it was a little bit of a grind, but I didn't even think about it at the time. Now looking back at it, I'm like, that, that, was, that was something. But I, I don't know why. I never really got super – I mean, I felt like a weirdo when I was in Arkansas or Oklahoma at first. I felt like I was like a Jehovah's Witness. I felt like I was uninvited. I was a little older. You know, I was 28. There was, most people were 18 to 22. I felt really awkward being on these campuses. You know, a third of the people in Arkansas are in camouflage. And then one day, something kind of just spoke to me. You know what? I may be physically alone here, but whenever you speak up to animals, every single one of you, me, are we ever really alone? Absolutely not. We got billions of animals trapped in the cages rooting you on. We got millions of vegans all around the world. We got activists rooting you on. So I don't care if you're physically alone. Remember that you are never alone when you talk about these issues. That makes it easier, because I, I think one of the harder things to go vegan for a lot of people is the social component. They feel weird sometimes when they go vegan, and they're the only vegan um, when they're in their social circle. And that takes other, that's why it's good to have uh, social support as well. Another thing that inspired me, other than not being alone, was realizing that, uh, yes, the world is disgusting on so many levels. There's wars, there's injustice, there's racism, there's environmental degradation. Uh, you know, the horrible things happen to people. You know, 21-year-old uh, women get cystic fibrosis and die after a lung transplant. You know, the world is not fair. There's a lot of horrible things in the world, and I don't want to dismiss that. But just as these animal horrors are happening, don't ever forget all the beauty in the world, how all these people came from around the world to be here in Esh today. All these people care about animals. There's people in Mexico, India, Guatemala, all around the world fighting for this issue. People are going vegan in droves. There's so many new vegan items up. Never forget to be positive, especially if you feel a little down or have a bad experience. Never forget all the victories. Foie gras is getting banned. You can't sell stuff tested on animals. Uh, the circus shut down. Like they're, they're, you know, they're having campaigns in Los Angeles to have vegan dog food that will hopefully spread. You know, there's so I get chills thinking about it. There's so much good happening. So don't ever forget that if you feel a little run down. And I'm also very inspired by a lot of these activists in this room and, uh, and history. I was a big nerd, so I read a lot of history books. So are you familiar with the Cuban Revolution? It's a long story. But the shortest version is you have these like 80s, uh, you know, Fidel was a lawyer. He gets 120 of his friends to attack a professional army barracks. Almost everybody gets killed. It's a horror. They torture these poor idealistic kids afterwards. Fidel goes to prison for the rest of his life, him and his brother and another guy. They torture these kids so bad that he starts to, you know, everybody else is depressed in prison. They're like, oh, we're going to die. We're going to die in here. We, our lives are over. And Fidel reads 500 books, and he starts a campaign from in his prison cell to get released. And he mobilizes a campaign uh, to, to, to have the people demand that he's released because they tortured so many of these young kids after they uh, surrendered. By some miracle, he gets out of prison, and they're gonna, the security is going to kill him. He runs over to the U.S., and uh, give speeches for, I think, six to nine months to raise money for a, a, a patrol boat to you know, invade the country again. Goes to Mexico, him, Che Guevara comes up from uh, Guatemala. He famously joins uh, the, the Cuban Revolution as a doctor at first, then later becomes a comandante. But they, they were training in this one base. The, the local police raided. The US FBI is in there. The CIA, the Cuban intelligence are working with the Mexican intelligence. Che and Fidel get arrested. They bribe somebody. A sympathetic judge gets them out of jail. Everybody's trying to stop them. There are 86 guys going against 20,000 professional soldiers. And these are not professional soldiers. The million dollars that he raised gets stolen so they don't have a boat. So he finds a leaky yacht as a replacement from those nine months of activity. He was never daunted. And uh, the, these 84 or 86 guys hop in his leaky boat. One engine fails. It's supposed to take a day and a half, two days to cross the, the Caribbean. It takes them three and a half days. Search planes and, and boats are, are looking for them. One guy falls off. Everybody's seasick. They're not used to being on a boat. Fidel, the, everybody's like, hey, we got to keep going. Sorry about Manuel. You know, we, we, we're going to die if we stay here. Fidel says, no, I'm not going to leave a man behind. They circle for three hours. They find the guy. Everybody's like, this guy will never leave us alone. They finally get to the shore of Cuba, and there's airplanes, boats, and 20,000 people waiting to kill them. Did they stop? No. 
Did they hit land? No, they shipwreck. And famously, Che Guevara takes a bottle of ammunition instead of a, you know, a bucket of, uh, what's it called, uh, medical supplies. So now they start hacking through the mangrove swamps. There's bugs, there's humidity, it's hot, there's no water, they're like exhausted. They finally get to dry land after three days, I believe. They sit there for two hours or something, and then they're ambushed by 1,200 professional soldiers. Everybody almost dies again. It's a horror show. Che gets shot in the neck. 12 people survive. Raul Castro, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara among those 12. After those 12 regroup in the mountains by some miracle, six of them are like, I'm not going to die. Everybody's dying. This has not worked twice. Let's get out of here. Short story long, these six guys didn't stop fighting. After three years or whatever it was, you know, the Cuban Revolution triumph took on the biggest military in the history of mankind to try to liberate their own resources, what have you. So if they can keep fighting over that, you know, I can deal with a snide comment. I can deal with being a little tired. Um, so I derive a lot of inspiration from history. Emma Goldman. There was a guy, there was a, a brown man in a loincloth that took on the biggest military power in the world, the British Empire, and guess what? They had to get out. So uh, never lose that uh, faith that veganism is inevitable. This is necessary, and you can be a huge part of that. Well, I can't thank you enough for hearing me out. I hope this gave you some food for thought. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be here the rest of the conference through Saturday if you have any questions about outreach or any specific one-on-one -on -one examples. Thank you so much for all that you do. And thank you for hearing me out. Hope you like my talk. Please comment, like, share, and subscribe. These great videos from the Luxembourg Animal Rights Conference. Go vegan if you're not already vegan and get involved helping animals. You can also go to veganarrage.org if you want some more tips on in getting involved.